Hello, my name's Simon Prickett, and this is No, Maybe, and Close Enough, where we're going to look at some probabilistic data structures with Python. So the problem we're going to look at today is related to counting things. So counting things seems quite easy on the face of it. We just maintain a count of the things that we want to count, and every time we see a new and different thing, we add one to that count. So how hard can this be? So Let's assume we want to count sheep. So I want to count sheep and I'm doing that in Python. So I have here a very simple Python program that does exactly that. So Python has a set data structure built into it. These are great for this sort of problem because we can add things to a set. And if we add them multiple times, uh, it will deduplicate them. And then we can ask it how many things are in the set. So on the face of it, we can answer the question, how many sheep have I seen with a set? So here I'm declaring a set and then adding some sheep uh, ear ID tags to it. So 1934, 1201, 1199, etc. Then further down, you'll see I add 1934 again. That's actually going to get deduplicated. So when we ask this how many sheep are in the, uh, in the set of sheep that we've seen by using the len function, it's not going to count that one twice. So that's perfect. We've got an exact number of how many sheep we've seen. So another question that I might want to ask when I'm counting things is not just how many sheep have I seen, but have I seen this particular sheep? So in this case, I need to be able to retrieve data from my set or data structure that I'm using to determine if we've seen this before. So it's a sort of set membership query. Is sheep 1934 in the set of sheep that we've seen, for example? So. Here again, I'm using a Python set, and this seems to be a great fit for this problem. So I declare the set with some sheet tags that we've seen already, so 1934, 1201, etc. Then I have a simple function that just basically says, is the sheep ID passed to it in the set of sheep that we've seen? And it either is or it isn't. And that's going to work perfectly, and it's going to be reliable 100% of the time. So when we call, have I seen 1934? It's going to say, yes, we have seen sheep 1934. Have we seen 1283? It's going to say, no, we haven't seen that one before, or at least not yet. So when we're counting things and we want to answer these two questions, how many things have I seen or distinct things have I seen? And have I seen this particularly distinct thing? Then a set got us covered. It's done everything we need. So that's it. We're done. Um, problem solved. But, well, are we? So the set works great and it's 100% accurate, but we had a relatively small data set. So we had a few sheep and we were remembering the IDs of all the sheep and the IDs were fairly short. So remembering all of those in a set and storing all of that data is not a huge problem. But if we need to count huge numbers of distinct things, so we're operating at internet scale or we're operating at sort of Australia, New Zealand sheep farm scale, then we might need to think about this again because we might have some issues here. So at scale, when things get big with counting things, we start to hit problems with, for example, memory usage. So remembering all of those things in a set starts to get expensive in terms of the amount of memory that that set requires uh, to be stored. It also gives us a problem of horizontal scaling. So if we're counting lots and lots and lots of things, the chances are it's not just going to be one person or one process out there counting things and using a local in-memory process variable to do it. We're going to have several processes counting things, and they're going to want to count together and maintain a common counter. So we need a way of sharing our counters and making sure that updates to them are atomic so that we do not get uh, false counts or we don't have a problem of if one counter goes down, we've lost some of the data or we can't fit all of the data in a single process's memory. So once we get to scale, counting things exactly starts to get very expensive in terms of memory usage, uh, potentially time, performance, and concurrency. Um, now, one way that we might want to resolve that would be to move the counting problem out of memory and into, say, a database. So 
Here I'm using a database. I'm using the Redis database for the reason that it has a set data structure. So we can take the set that we were using in Python and we can move that out of the Python and into Redis. So this is a fairly simple code change. We now just create a Redis connection using the Redis module. And we basically tell it what the key name of a Redis set is that we want to store our sheet counts in. And we just s add things to it. So in Python, where we were doing dot add to add things to a set, Redis is dot s add for set add. Same sort of thing. We say which set we want to put it in because we're now a database. So we can store multiple of these in a key value store way. And we give it the tags. The same behavior happens. So when I had 1934 a second time, 1934 will be deduplicated. And now because we're using Redis for this and it's out of the Python process and accessible across the network, we can connect multiple counters to it. So we can solve a couple of problems here. We can solve the problem of what if I have a load of people out there counting the sheep and we want to maintain a centralized overall count. And we've solved the problem of um, the memory limitations in a given process. So the process is no longer becoming a memory hog with all of these sheep IDs in a set. We've moved that out to a database. So in this case, Redis. But we've still got the problem here of um, overall size. So as we add more and more and more sheep, the data set is still going to take up a reasonable amount of space. And that's going to grow according to how we add sheep. And if we were using longer tags, it would grow more every time we added a new item because we're having to store the items. So let's have a look at how we can determine if we've seen this sheet before when using a database as well. So here we're again using Redis. So imagine we put all of our data into that set um, and we've now got shared counters and lots of people can go out and count the sheep. And to know if we've seen this sheet before, we then basically have a new have I seen function and some preamble before it that clears out any old set in Redis and sets some sample data. And what we're gonna do now is instead of using an if a uh, sheep tag is in the set, like we did with the Python set, we're going to use a Redis command called s is member. So set is member. And we're going to say if this sheep ID is in the set, then we've seen it. Otherwise, we haven't. And as we'd expect, that works exactly the same as it does in Python with sets. But we've solved these two problems. We've solved the concurrency problem. We've solved the uh, individual process memory limit problem. But we've really just moved that memory problem into the database itself. So to solve that and to enable counting at like really large scale without chewing through a lot of memory, we're going to need to make some trade-offs. So trade-offs basically involve giving up one thing in exchange for another. So our sheep on the left there has its fleece. Our sheep on the right has given up its fleece in exchange for being a little bit cooler. But we can determine that both are sheep. So this is kind of a key thing here is we've been storing the whole data set and all of the data to determine which sheet we've seen, but can we get away with storing something about the data or bits of the data and still know that it's that sheep? So the sheep on the left and the sheep on the right, we can still sell their sheep even though one has lost its fleece. So this is where something called probabilistic data structures come in. These are a family of data structures that make some trade-offs. So rather than being completely accurate, they will trade off accuracy for some storage efficiency. So we'll see we can save a lot of memory by giving up a bit of accuracy. We might also trade off some functionality. So as we'll see, we can save a lot of memory by not actually storing the data, which means we can no longer get a list back of what sheep we've seen, but we can still determine whether we've seen a sheep with reasonable accuracy. The other trade-off that's often involved with probabilistic data structures is performance. Um, but we'll mostly be looking at these three. So we have two questions that we wanted to ask here. So how many sheep have I seen is the first one. And a data structure or an algorithm that we can use for that, that comes from these probabilistic data structures family, is called the hyperloglog. -log. So what that does is it approximates distinct items. So it basically guesses at the cardinality of a set based on um, 
not actually storing the data, but hashing the data and storing information about it. So there's some pros and cons to this. So the way the hyperlog log works is it's going to run all the data through some hash functions, and it's going to look at the longest uh, number of leading zeros in what results from that. It's going to hash everything to a zero one binary sequence. I'm going to look at the longest sequence to start with. And there's a formula that we'll look at, but we don't need to understand, which will enable us to um, determine if we've seen so many items before. So it'll allow us to guess the cardinality of the set with reasonable accuracy. So the benefits here is the hyperlog log has a similar interface to a set. We can add things to it and we can add it for, ask it for how many things are in there. It's going to save a lot of space because we're using a hashing function. So it'll come down to like a fixed size data structure, no matter how much data we put in there. Uh, but we can't retrieve the items back again, unlike with a set. And that's both a benefit and a trade-off because we can't retrieve them. That's great in some cases where we just want to count and we don't want the overhead of storing the information. For example, if it's uh, personally identifiable information. But it's also a bad thing if we did want to get the information back, like in a set. So we can use hyperlog log when we want to count, but we don't necessarily need that information, the actual information back again. Um, the other trade-off involved here is it's not built into the Python language. So we'll need to use some sort of library implementation and we'll need to use something else to store it into a data store, which we'll, we'll look at. So here's the algorithm for hyperlog log. Um, this is on Wikipedia. You can read about how it works if you're interested. But basically, it's a lot of math to do with um, hashing things down to zeros and ones, looking at how many leading zeros there are, keeping account of the greatest number of leading zeros we've seen. Then you can actually approximate the size of the data set based on, on that. Um, so the takeaway here is we don't need to do that. We're going to use a library or another implementation that's built into a data store. And we'll look at both of those. So. The hyperlog log doesn't actually answer the question, how many sheep have I seen for us? It's going to answer the question, approximately how many sheep have I seen? Which may well be good enough for our data set. Um, and it's going to save us a lot of memory. So here in a Python program, I'm using the hyperlog log module. And I am declaring a set as well for comparison. So we're going to see how a set compares with a hyperlog log. I'm declaring my hyperlog log and I'm giving it an accuracy factor, which is something you can tune in the algorithm. So you can trade off the amount of data bits it's going to take for the relative accuracy of the count. And when we come to look at that with a data store, we'll actually see how the, the sizes compare. So we've then got a loop. We're going to add 100,000 sheep to both the hyperlog log and the set. And then we're going to ask both of them, how many do you have? And when we do that, what we'll see that, as we expect, the set is absolutely 100% correct. We've got 100,000 sheep in our set. And the hyperlog log has slightly overcounted, so 100,075. So it's within a good uh, margin of error. And the trade-off here is that the set has taken up way more memory than the hyperlog log has. And we'll put some numbers on that when we look at it in a database. So. One of the reasons I picked Redis as the data store for this is because it has sets and it also has hyperlog logs as data types. So here I have a small Python program. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to store sheep in a Redis set and in a Redis hyperlog log. So we begin by deleting those and loop over our 100,000 sheep and add IDs to Redis for those. And we put them into a set and we use the pfadd commands down there to add them to the hyperlog log. PF is uh, Philippe Flagellet, the uh, French mathematician who partly came up with the hyperlog log algorithm. So Redis commands for that are named after him. And then when we've done that, we'll again ask Redis, what's the cardinality of the set? How many sheep did you count? It'll tell us 100,000 because it's accurate. And it'll tell us the approximation with the hyperlog log so we can compare. So here we can see in the Redis implementation, um, we got 100,000 sheep, as we'd expect, and it took about 4.5, 4.6 megabyte of memory to store that. With the hyperlog log, we got 99,565 sheep, so we were pretty close to the 100,000. 
but it only took 12k of memory and we could keep adding sheep to that all day and it's only going to take 12k of memory whereas the set would have to keep growing so you can start to see some of the trade-offs here we're getting an approximate account we're saving a lot of memory so the second probabilistic data structure I wanted to look at is the Bloom filter. So the Bloom filter is used for our other question that we wanted to ask, which is, have I seen this sheep? So that's a set membership type of question. Uh, is the sheep one, two, three, four in the set of sheep that we've seen? And when we're using a set, we'll get an absolute answer. We'll get yes or no. When we're using a Bloom filter, we'll get an approximated answer. So we'll get absolutely no, it's not in the uh, set, or we'll get maybe it is, there's a high likelihood that it is in the set. Um, and again, that uncertainty comes from us not storing the data in the Bloom filter. So we're going to hash the data and we're going to trade that memory savings off for a little bit of accuracy. So the way the Bloom filter works, and I have one laid out here, is that you have a bit array, and that is how many bits you want to make it wide. So one of the things we can configure is the, the width of the bit array. So how much memory is it going to take? Here I've got 15 bits as a simple example that fits on the screen. And then we can configure a number of hash functions. So every time we put a new uh, sheep ID or a new data item into the Bloom filter, we're going to run it through those hash functions and they all have to return a result that uh, varies between zero and the length of the bit array. So essentially they're going to identify positions in the bit array that that sheep ID hashes to. And we're going to use three in our example. So each sheep ID we're going to hash to three different bits and we'll see how that enables us to answer whether we've seen that sheep before in a no or maybe style. So if we start out with adding the ID 1009, let's say that we have three hash functions and the first one hashes it to position one there. Um, the second one hashes it to position six and the third one to position eight. Then what is gonna happen here is that each uh, bit in that filter is then set or the bit array is set to one. So we know that a hash function has landed on that. So similarly, when we add more sheep, so we add sheep 9107 here, the three hash functions result in these positions. And we can see in this case that 9107 generated two new positions that were previously unset in our bit array and one existing one. So there's potential here for, as with a lot of hashing, clashes. So the more hash filters we use, the wider the, uh, the bit array, we can kind of dial some of that out. But in this simple example, we're going to get some clashes. Adding more, we get 1458. That hashes to three things that were already taken. So we don't set any new items, or we don't set any new bits to one here. Now, when we want to look something up, what we do is the same thing, but we look at the value of what's in the bit array. So here, when I look up sheep 2045, have we sheep, seen sheep 2045? The first hash function hashes to a position where we've got a one, so it's possible we have. The second one hashes to a position where we've got a zero. So that means we haven't seen this sheep before. We could actually stop and not continue with the third hashing function, but for completeness, I've shown it. So as soon as we get one that returns a zero, we know that we haven't seen that before, absolutely definitely not seen it. 9107 here is a sheep that we have seen before. Um, all of the hash functions land on a position that already has a one in it. So we can say there is a strong likelihood that we've seen this sheep before. And the reason why we can't say that um, with absolute certainty is if we look at sheet 2989 here, that's not in the set of sheet that we added at the top there. So this is not one we've seen before, but its number hashes to positions that are all set to one. So the Bloom filter in this case is going to lie to us. It's going to say 2989, there's a strong likelihood that that sheep exists, but actually it doesn't. So 
We are trading off here a lot of memory use um, because we're getting down to just this uh, bit array and some computational time because we're doing hashing across a number of functions. But we are going to save a lot of memory. And if we want to know absolutely whether we've seen this sheep and no or strong possibility is an OK answer, then we can use this and we can save ourselves a lot of memory. So here's some uh, Python code that uses this. So we're going to use, again, uh, some library code for a Bloom filter using PyProbables. And we just set up a Bloom filter so we can configure it. Um, and this will work out how many hashes and the bit array size, et cetera. So we're saying we want to store that many items. We want to store 200,000 items. And we can dial in a false positive rate that's acceptable to us. And then that will figure out the memory size used. And that's part of our trade-offs. So the more accurate we get, the more memory, the less accurate, the less memory. Then we basically just add 100,000 sheep to the Bloom filter in much the same way as we did with the set. And our have I seen function is pretty much the same. Again, we have a check function that says, have I seen the sheep? And it'll say, I might have seen it because we can't be 100% sure. Or no, I definitely haven't. So this is a good drop-in for a set. The interface is very, very similar, but we're saving a lot of memory. And when we run this, you get the answers that we kind of expect. So it might have seen 9018, and it hasn't seen 454901. So we can also do this in data stores. So again, I picked Redis as a data store for this talk because it has, via an installable module, an implementation of a Bloom filter. So similarly, I can uh, create a Redis Bloom filter. The BF reserve command there is doing pretty much the same thing. It's saying I want to store about 200,000 items with about that accuracy. And then I can add sheep into the Bloom filter. And I can ask it, does this sheep exist in the Bloom filter? And we will get the same sort of results as we did before. Um, so I might have seen it or I've not seen it. But we are saving a lot of memory because now instead of using a set that's just going to grow as we add things to it, we've got this fixed bit array that isn't going to grow, but it is going to fill up as we add more sheep to it. And there are strategies for stacking Bloom filters. So as one bit array fills, putting another one on top of it, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but it is a problem that can be solved. So when should you use probabilistic data structures? Well. Trade-offs. So if an approximate count is good enough, a hyperlog log's great. So for example, it doesn't really matter that we know exactly how many people read that article on Medium, as long as we're in the right ballpark. Um, you could use a Bloom filter when it's OK to have some false positives. So for example, um, have I recommended this article on Medium to this user before? Doesn't really matter if we occasionally get that wrong. Um, and we're saving a lot of memory again, especially in those cases where we need to maintain one of these data structures per user. Um, it might be advantageous to use these where you don't need to store or retrieve the original data. So if the original data is either personal stuff that you don't want to store, or it's just never ending. So it's a continuous stream of say temperature, humidity values, um, which leads me on to the last point, which is, when you're working with huge data sets where exact strategies just aren't going to work out for you, then um, you're going to have to make some trade-offs. And these, this family of data structures offers a good set of trade-offs for between memory and accuracy. So that was everything I had. Um, the code that you've seen in this talk I have put in a small GitHub repo, which also has a Docker Compose file. So you can both play with it in Python, just in memory, and you can play with it in Redis and have it inside a data store. Hope you enjoyed this and have a great time at the conference.